this original podcast series, we take a peek behind the curtain of some of the world's biggest film events and talk to some of the industry leaders and working pros across every department of independent film and television to find out what it's really like. The Hub is a weekly in-depth chat about all things film and television. What movies are featuring at the upcoming GMA Awards ceremony, past winners, premieres, nominees, red carpet gossip, career advice, and insider info to help you better prepare for a career in the film industry. You're listening to The Hub, your weekly fix for all things film and television, and some other stuff. Hosted by Jason Matthewson. And Didi and Didi and Didi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome along to episode stream number seven, albeit this will be uh, episode number four uh, in season one. And please help me welcome along the awesome Mr. Eric Blakeney. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Very well, thank you. Excellent. How's uh, how's everything been for you? Are you you're here in London at the moment, right? Yeah, I live in London. Yeah. So how's how's um how's how's your Corona been going? How's your lockdown been going? Should I say rather, has it been rather trying? The Corona apocalypse, as we call it here. <laughs> um, the first month I really enjoyed. I was just I I loved the the, the turning off of all the consciousness and. London being the streets being quiet. Now I'm starting to get a little stir crazy. It's getting a little bit monotonous, right? I mean, it, there is. I was yeah. just saying to some of the other guests uh, that we've had on all of this week, in fact, that um, there is a certain level of normality that's setting into this um, that's rather kind of nice um, in that it, the streets are quieter. People seem to be more forthcoming. People seem to be happier go figure um even though we're locked up people seem to be nicer and more pleasant to one another uh and certainly more giving of their time at, at the very least um even some very notable people um you know you see people coming out specifically artists uh, and the creative people i would say uh coming out to entertain uh, and in whatever way that they that they would whether it be stand up from their living room um uh, brad pitt done his snl sketch which he was meant to do on well snl obviously uh but he did it from his living room, um, and I think he pushed the boundaries of, of um, what would have been allowed uh, more than, than he would have had he went to the studio and done it for real. Um, so I think that's really nice. Um, you know. But yeah, I agree with you. The first little while has been like, oh, this is cool. Kick back, watch some television, do a little bit of something. And then when it when it's kind of realizes that this is real and this is setting in and um, you know we're going to be in this for a while, uh, it's starting to get a bit... Starting to play a little bit, but it gives us the time as well to 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 develop things um, that maybe was in the back of your mind for a while that time didn't uh, allow for in the hustle bustle pace of of quote unquote the real world. I think this is an opportunity, an amazing opportunity for the entire planet to have a rethink that we never have had before, and we we, we never would have been given. We've 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 had shocks to the system. And, um, you know, the big cr the, the financial crash of 08, which, you know, bankrupted a lot of people and, you know, did, you know, did made it normal to be broke, which was kind of cool because it made people nicer to each other and less protective of their status because <laughs> they had none anymore. But now the, the entire system is being kind of exposed for like, you know, how we build our governments and our economy. You know, America seems to be doing the, the worst because we have the for first world country, we have the um, most deficient uh, safety nets. Mm -hmm. So so you're seeing a lot of people who are becoming incredibly desperate. And, you know, all of those people marching into the capitals with their guns, demanding that the economy is reopened. You know, it's easy for us to laugh at them and go, oh, these people are idiots with guns, which they are idiots with guns. But the, what they most are are desperate people hmm. who can see that if they don't get back to work, they're, they're, they're going to be thrown in the streets and they're, you know, they're going to starve. So it's it is a chance for everybody to go, you know, whoa, look, whoa, look at what we've created. How do we make this better? And um, I think I think the mistake would be for and, and but the natural reaction is everybody goes, we've got to get back to normal. N no, we've seen we've seen what's wrong. Let's not get back to mm. normal. Let's let's make something better. 
so that if something, if we're faced with something like this again, we, we respond to it beautifully or, or at least better than we are right now, where, where people don't have to feel so desperate that they all have to march, you know, with guns in the streets. Mm. And, you know, they're basically saying, let us go back to work, whether they know that's them. You know, they're all shouting freedom like they're in Braveheart, but they're, but, but they're really saying I'm desperate and scared and I want to go back to work. Yeah, because, I mean, for the most part, I, I think, you know, these people that's that's marching the capitals with the guns or, or whatever, you know, there's reiterations of that from all various countries around the world. I think it's, for the most part, most of those people are the ones that are going to be ha- hit the hardest because they're not, you know, Fortune 500 owners. They're not elite CEOs. They're not the, the top tier, the 1%. They're the ones that are going to get left behind. And, you know, and one thing I will say is is, you know, a lot of people are giving our governments a hard time. I think for the first time, maybe ever, all of our governments and our respective world leaders are working, for, at least for the most part, in our favor, I would have hoped. Um, but, you know, they're just people at the end of the day. And yes, they are the government. Yes, they their job is to be prepared. And they weren't as prepared as they should have been. And if you stick in a dig below the covers just a bit um apparently there's 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 speculation that these medical professionals and and um cdc folks and people in the know basically and even just one one off the top of my head is bill gates for christ's sakes i mean everyone knows who he is uh they they were saying that this is coming this pandemic is coming and it's going to come hard in fact there was a report that the gates foundation put out in september of of uh 19 so only a couple of months before this hit saying that it is um it's not not that it's coming it is um it's imminent it's you know it's happening and uh it was ignored so maybe in that respect we could be better but uh you know these these government leaders are just people at the end of the day they don't really fully know what to do and they're trying their best so we need to give them a bit of a break but at the same time, I agree with you. Uh, I think these people are just desperate folk who who want to get back to normality. But uh, we should be preparing to to build a better normal than the normal we had because the normal we had didn't work. It was very, very flawed. Well, I think one is sorry to disagree with one point. I don't think we should give our governments a break at all. They okay. put us in an incredibly inequitable hole. And the problem that we've had is we've, we've come to think of our governments as our parents. Mom mm-hmm. and dad are looking out for us when, in fact, our governments, spe- specifically, you know, the U.S. government, the U.K. government, they're working for, you know, big business. They're not working for people anymore. And I, I think one of the things we always needed, especially in a democracy, was to make sure that the, our government is afraid of us that we're always going to hold them accountable. We're always going to make life difficult for them and not obediently do what they say. Um, So I'm all for um, people uh, trying to uh, take the the power back as much as they can and make, I I think one of the flaws in our system is that we're seeing that our our government doesn't work for us and that we need to find a way to make them more accountable. Not that they're mommy and daddy who are supposed to come and save us, but that they're they're supposed to be custodians of a system that serves us, not just the insanely wealthy, which is what what has been happening for you know about the last forty years. Absolutely. And it, it just it comes in steps, you know, incrementally. It keeps getting that way. So. Uh, yeah, I back to, I, I, back to Polito chat. <laughs> I definitely agree, but I think maybe there. I, I mean, I've, I've personally, I've stopped watching the news. I mean, for the first week or ten or fourteen days, whatever yeah. it was, I was watching it twenty four seven, and it just got too much. I was like, I can't watch this anymore. And I mean, I'm not even up to speed with the UK politics and what's going on right now, let alone the US politics. But from a, from a far out glimpse every now and again, um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that the uh, the Trump has really fucked things up, like even more so than than Boris or than than uh, Trudeau or than any of the other leaders. We're all they all kind of fucked up in some respect, but they're trying. I think. Um, I think Trump's really, you know, screwed the boat. Um, and I, but I don't know what yeah. the results of that are. I think the American people are just really particularly unhappy with how he's handled the situation, opposed to even the disturn from like the British public or whoever else. Well, it, it uh, clearly well. I, Boris to me is like a mini Donald anyway. He's just you know um, 
But um, <laughs> no, his leadership, his, his leadership ability is being exposed. Again, I say this is a tremendous opportunity for us. To, I mean, we're watching Trump unhinged, losing his cool. And you say, well, wait a minute. This is the most powerful man in the world, seemingly. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably not not good to to put our entire fate in the hands of somebody who really can't handle any pushback mm -hmm. um, where, you know, but but I think I think it it's very important that we don't look at our governments as a cult of personality. Like Donald is a really bad talk show host. We put him in charge of our nation thinking, well, I like his blunt style. Yes, but he had no other skills. Now we could say, oh, well, the problem is, you know, we wanted, you know, Obama got us all excited and we thought we were going to get some real hope and change. And he basically gave America even further to Wall Street and expanded to seven wars. And it was just like, dude, we put a lot of belief in you. And 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 Barack is, you know, the opposite of, of, of Donald Trump in style. I mean, I, clearly it. You would want him in, you know, in charge of making everybody feel good and just Absolutely. go, don't worry, I've got this under control. Whereas Donald, no, it's not my fault. It's his fault. No, it's your fault. It's I know. Like, there does seem to so, be, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, it can happen, but like, I don't know why. I, I don't know why. I would just, I would feel a whole lot more comfortable if Barack was running the show over there than Trump. <laughs> For a, about a million and one reasons, but just just specifically, just take everything else out, just the corona thing. I mean, let's put Trump's, you know, ridiculousness to the one side, but just that one problem, I'd feel far more comfortable with, like, Barack was, he was like, like he was that comforting shoulder, he was that... You know, you believed him. He was a good. He was. He was. He was the good image of daddy. But don't yeah. forget, we've had in the last twenty years. Uh, well, we've had three big global catastrophes uh, that that America and the UK responded to. Obviously, nine eleven, which got us into endless war. Which obviously, <laughs> there's all kinds of reasons that that response was not the correct one. Mm -hmm. um, we had the meltdown of uh, the uh, financial meltdown of 08. And now we've got the coronavirus. Now, what's interesting is that Obama basically funneled trillions of dollars up into the uh, up into the elite, up into Wall Street, um, let over five million Americans be foreclosed on and lose their homes. So and and now with the bail, so that was the big bailout package that kind of betrayed America, uh, went totally, you know, to basically Goldman Sachs and, and you know, JP Morgan, um, Morgan Chase. Um, and now we've had this massive trillion dollar bailout that the Congress has all given to the elites again, at, without people you know, people are desperate and need their rent paid, and that didn't go. They gave everybody a $1,200 check, which won't get them through a month, mm -hmm. and all of those trillions. So it's very similar. Now, Donald does it with terrible, grotesque style, and he didn't really uh, fashion this bailout. That was fashioned by, by McConnell and Pelosi and Schumer. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, he does it he, – he, these two crises have been handled the exact same way. It's just a, a, a Obama had mu just much greater style and savvy. Mm -hmm. But aside, but the, but the roots of what's happening are it, it's exactly the same. The the people are getting screwed the exact same way these past two uh, crises. But how do you how do you think the difference is going to be though? Because with the eight uh, the two thousand eight crash, um, that only affected the economy. Okay, that's a very you know obviously the economy is not just it's huge, but it only affected the economy. And when it did happen, the the powers that be were able to call in the bright, the best and brightest minds and economists and mathematicians and so on and so forth to to try to solve this. Now, the corona is affecting the entire planet and every single facet of it. But we're not able to call in our best and brightest to try and solve the situation because of the distancing thing. So. I think that this is going to be detrimentally more, um, you know, evasive than than the uh, than the 2008 crash, unfortunately. Well, probably uh, uh, the the but again, the problem with the coronavirus boils down to an economic crisis. There's a, everybody can stay at home and social distance. What they're going to be afraid of is that they can't buy food and rent. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's just an economic problem. So we're 
we're, we're being uh, made more aware at an increasing rate of the problems in our structure. That's why we, we, we have to get past this idea that, oh, we just have to get rid of Trump, who, by the way, we have to get rid of. Absolutely. But the idea that a cult of a nicer personality is get, going to get us out of the mess we're in, that's, that, that's an illusion. That's, that's, that's the nice daddy illusion versus the, the cruel daddy illusion mm. it, when it's systemic. We have to change the system. It doesn't really matter which kind of you, we, we just kind of regularly swap personalities anyway and, and, and go through the same the kind of degradation of our system. So that's got people have got to look systemically. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a great opportunity where everybody's going, you know, we're all shut in this. You know, a lot of people are going to give their lives for this opportunity we have to look at what we've created. And that's a powerful thing. And it'd be, it'd be very, you know, when people go to war and sacrifice their lives, uh, you, you know, we have to honor them. Well, a lot of people are going to die for, what, for us to take a look at a system that really isn't working for us. And how do we, because we could have responded better and we could have responded, in, you know, with, with good systems in place. So um, it'd be great to see that we use this opportunity now. Yeah, I, I mean, I really, really hope so. It'll, it will be, it will be our own um, shortcomings if we didn't, um, yeah. and and to to understand because we, look, we all know that the system's broken. We all know it needs to change, but we were yeah. all we were told uh, over and over and over and over again before this that it couldn't change. It would take too long. It would cost too much. It would be too detrimental to the various countries that tried. Bullshit. I mean, just the other day, I said this a couple of times. Um, the, I mean, this is only one, to, and it's a very small one, but it's well, not terribly small. But anyway, um, the Venetian Post and uh, the local paper or whatever in Venice uh, put out a report. Um, for the first time in something like forty years, they were able to see the bottom of their canals and to which dolphins and all these various beautiful fish had come. Why? Because it wasn't getting churned up by the crap that them boats and pollution and all the rest. And that's just. And and that's that amazing. and by the way that was like three or four weeks ago, so this yes. that was only like maybe two or three weeks in right, and that was Mother Nature doing that on her own accord. We done nothing, and she sorted that shit out by herself. So anyone who's going, oh, we can't fix that lake, we can't clean up the ocean, we can't stop making plastic, we can, and we need to be better, or we simply won't have a planet. We just won't have one anymore. Yeah, and I think what you what you bring up is the great look that we're getting. A friend of mine sent me a, a video that his his best mate took in Estepona in southern Spain, which showed all these dolphins swimming around in the harbor there. And I would, I I'd just been there uh, with my partner. We were we were having a lunch at that spot, and it was so shitty and polluted and filled with these nasty boats. And then. Just a few months later, the dolphins are going. Oh, this is great. Let's have, you know jump in That's the water. Lovely. It's such a nice place there. My my dad's sister lives in um, Cadiz, so just a little bit further oh, down okay. the coast. Yeah, right by Gibraltar. Really nice. Um, okay, I want to get uh, definitely want to talk more about this and about uh, setting up a system because that nicely takes us into proms, your new yes. venture. But before we get to that, let's uh, let's take a little. A little jump back a bit um, to to where where it began. I mean, with the creatives and with the the um, the writers and the directors and the actors. So the more uh, you know, the the creative one. Uh, well. You know, performance ones. I'd say. I, I like to say, um, well, writing's not a performance. You know what I'm trying to say. Anyway, I like Hollywood. to. <laughs> yeah, I like to ask the three W's, which I call the uh, when, why, and where. So the creative bug, whatever that was, and whatever facet it got to you. May, I mean, maybe you didn't start out as a writer. Maybe you start. Like I asked this question the other day to uh, Ian Beatty from Game of Thrones and Gangs of London, who's a very good close friend of mine, and uh, he's now a professional actor. But I didn't know this. He started off in the circus, literally. Um, so I know, right? And what a great story. But anyway, that's the. Did the creative bug come to you in in the form of writing? Um, maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. But whatever came to you, when, where, and why? Um, I w my first love was music, and when I was uh, seventeen, I was uh, I was accepted at Juilliard. I came to London for two weeks. Um, just just before the semester started, and I joined a band and stayed five years. So uh, music was my first love, and still is in many ways. What I discovered was that I was better with words. That I was I, I was a very very good bass player, but I I I, I wasn't elite. 
I wasn't, I was, and I, I realized whether I'm elite or not as a writer, I, I'm better with, with manipulating words than I am with manipulating music. So I, it, it slowly came to me, you know, little by little, write, first writing lyrics for songs, then, then I started doing some jingles and, um, uh, and, you know, just playing with writing, poetry, short stories, and I originally decided I wanted to become a, a, a short story writer, and I, I'd moved to L.A., and I, my best friend was a stuntman, and he says, you, you got to be kidding. You will never pay your rent as a short story writer. It will not happen. Why don't you be a screenwriter? And I, I'd never considered it. So we went to the movies that night, and he says, just look at the whatever shitty movie it was, and he just says, just like look at what's going on and see if you could write that down. So I looked, and it was just like, yeah, yeah, okay, the people are talking this way. And, and I had a musical ear, so I, uh, dialogue was my first skill. I had to learn storytelling, you know, on the fly. Um, I, and I walked out, and I said, yeah, I could do that. So I started writing screenplays and hawking them around, and eventually I had a, fe I, I, a feature uh, screenplay that got a lot of attention and uh, a big up-and-coming director attached who also wound up in television. Um, and so I was brought into kind of the freelance TV writer world and I went very quickly rose, rose up that to be a showrunner on uh, Johnny Depp's TV show, 21 Jump Street. I, I, right before that, I'd done a, a much more important show called Wise Guy, um, where we, it was an undercar, it was, it was Donnie Brasco 10 years before Donnie Brasco, uh, you know, a, a, basically an undercover cop who, who becomes best friends with the mafia guy he's supposed to bring down. And it was the first time in television that, um, we had a situation where the bad guy was the good guy because he was emotionally pure mm. and, 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 and true to the relationship with the undercover cop and the undercover cop was the betrayer. And it was a very interesting show because we had um, we had real conflict on that staff, uh, guys who wanted to be more traditional, right? The good guys as the good guys and the bad guys, but the the showrunner and I just we we were like these unstoppable little I you know kind of new brats in Hollywood, who who were determined to do something unique, and we we started writing the hero as the bad guy and the bad guy as the hero. And it kind of it, it enabled the, the kind of in, certainly for shows like The Sopranos to come along, where where you're looking at the bad guy as a human being. That that was kind of the first time it was done. Hmm. So and then from there, you know, I kind of did the you know the TV thing, and then uh, started doing. I wanted to move out of Hollywood, and we we bought a little tiny vineyard in the Northern California. I wanted to move there and raise my kids on a vineyard. So we did that. I took a big gamble uh, to see whether I could. Uh, start writing films and uh, I was able to for a while and you know I, I directed one of them with Liam Neeson and Sandra Bullock yeah, and and that. then I kind of you know I kind of burned out on Hollywood and decided I wanted to go to Europe and you know play my bass a little write to do some other kind of kinds of writings uh, I, I I ghost wrote and co-wrote some uh, metaphysical books in 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 Eastern Europe which which was an amazing challenge um, and it was good to use that aspect of my, my thinking and find other skills in writing because I'd, I'd kind of gotten really used to the screenplay format. And, uh, so that's kind of been the adventure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if you go through your IMDb or your, your track record, there's some amazing shows on there and you've talked about obviously jump street with Johnny and, and then you went on to, to, uh, do your first feature, uh, both written and directed it with Liam and, and Sandy Bullock and, uh, and uh, Oliver Platt as well, which I love all three of those. In fact, uh, personally, Sandy Bullock is one of my favorite female actresses, period. She's like in my top five for sure. I think she's wonderful. Um, what was that like? America's sweetheart. Yeah, she's such a and she, But the thing is, like, she's, I think personally, I think she's a beautiful woman. I think she's immensely talented. I just I love her to bits. I think she's a wonderful. Uh, what's she like? And what's what was it like? Not false. Well, that's just me asking. But what was it like to go from, you know, running just Jump Street and writing on various projects, both television, film, and so forth, and then to getting uh, your first feature written, and then to go on and get it produced and yourself directed as well, and to be not just that, but like 
to be to be doing your your movie with Liam Neeson, Oliver Platt, and Sandy Bullock, who are A list movie stars. Um, so I mean, you started off, you went out of the gate at full speed. Most most people get a cameo from somebody of merit in their first thing if they're lucky. You got three superstars to lead your film. Um, how did that come about, and what was that like? And did you enjoy the the writing or the the uh, directing process? Wow, that's a lot. Of, there's, there's many parts to that, though, so I'll try to <laughs> streamline this. Um, I had gone to um, work on the last Mad Max movie. This is twenty over 20 years ago with George Miller, and I'd had a film, a thriller set up at Lumiere, who were very, very hot company that uh, they did Leaving Las Vegas, which won Nicolas Cage the Academy Award. So they were super hot. So I came back into L.A., um, uh, was still living in Northern California with a tremendous amount of heat. And I had this this idea for gun shy. And the con- the kind of theme of gun shy is that everybody is undercover. Nobody, nobody has, especially in their public life, can be who they really are. So I wrote this spec script and we, we went out with it in a, in, a, in a very big way. We didn't send the script out. We, we it, I had enough heat at the time that we, we could go to all the companies in, in Hollywood and say, if you want to read the script, you have to come into our office and read read the script, and you can't take it with you. Because uh, in Hollywood, the assistants get their hands on everything, and everything is old news by the time it's new news. So ah. we wanted to protect the script from that. So uh, it, it, you can't really do You can't even do that in Hollywood now. Um, but it was an opportunity. And... Um, I was I, I'd realized that I would I would be this was the kind of film that I, I, I think I was most suited to direct. And I learned a lot about directing from just sitting in a room with George Miller. So uh, I was insisting with this. So the script came out. It was the hottest script in town by far. Um, and I, I got a two picture deal as a writer at Warner Brothers. And one of those pictures was um uh, was a book a, a, a book adaptation for Sandra Bullock. So Sandy Sandy brought me in. Her company had been following me, so they were really excited by the thriller I had, and they'd heard about George Miller. And then I came out with this new script, um, and I did the book adaptation, and uh, it went really well. Warner's were happy. Sandy's company, they were all thrilled, and so I asked Sandy if she would. I'd found somebody to finance Gunshy. I, and um, we were going to do it very low budget, like three million. Mm-hmm. And I found a, a financier who said, "Listen, do you have any big stars? Can you go to Johnny Depp?" I said, "Well, no, I can't really go to Johnny anymore. We 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 did our dance already." And um, I said, "Well, the only thing is, I'm 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 pretty close to Sandra Bullock right now, but I don't have a big part for her. She's an A-list, you know, mm. type." And he said, how long would it take you to shoot her part out? And I said, well, there's a small role she could play. I could probably shoot her part in a week. He said, okay, offer her $2 million for a a week's work. He said, that's good money for anybody. (laughs) And he said, "Um, I'll give you $5 million to make your movie. I said, wow. So I called the company. I said, I got the money for the movie. It was a long shot. I didn't think there was any way Sandy would do it for me. And Sandy called me back. She said, Oh, you know, thanks for the offer. And I, I thought she was going to pass. And she was so polite. And she said, you know, I don't want to take the $2 million. And I'm like, oh, God, she's going to. She's really politely telling me to piss off. She says, no, I'd rather put the money into the film and I'd like to produce it. Oh, wow. So, OK. You know, the, the, <laughs> at this point, you know, like the Hollywood music is going off and I'm I'm dancing on the table like Fred Astaire. Um, so you just so went she from- came aboard. She came aboard as a producer. Um. And so here's the here's the a lot of things happened during that uh, making gun shy. I discovered a tremendous love for actors. I'm just I, I, I just couldn't believe I'd waited that long to direct and and and, and the incredible honest the, the bravery of every actor just to put themselves out there and try things that you know that are dangerous they, they a lot of times they don't necessarily believe in but they give you their their trust and I just like fell in love with actors but I also really came to understand the difference between movie stars and actors. And when you're dealing with A-list movie stars, you're not dealing – they are actors, but you're not dealing with the actor. You're dealing with the entity. Mm-hmm. And um, 
what happened was instead of doing the, the, the movie was a low budget film. It was a $10 million movie. Um, what happened was with, with Sandy came greater, darker forces. The CAA stepped in, pushed ah. the movie into a subsidiary of Disney that they were, they were doing this kind of, I, I, we were given, uh, a very, uh, an executive uh, bought the film from us and was financing it. He didn't. He didn't even understand the script. Didn't particularly like it. Was not an ally. Sandra was not a producer on a Sandra Bullock film. And uh, honestly, she was a little out of her element in how to protect me mm -hmm. from these from these massive forces. And it it, it as as um as Disney stepped in. Uh, deeper and deeper and started to and and uh, they did so much as they even fired her sister from the movie and her sister was the head of the her company and oh, wow. so i started becoming very very aware that there you, you know the politics at this high level were, were beyond my capabilities of, of maneuvering and um so the movie was you know it had a shitty it basically was dumped into the theaters um, and, um, it, it actually made, because it was a $10 million movie, it actually made a lot of money, uh, even though it shows a loss for forever, um, which is Hollywood accounting, which we'll go into when I talk about the people's Republic of movies. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was, it was kind of like my last, I, I was pretty much done with Hollywood. It, it really, it, it ruined a really nice relationship that I had with Sandy and she, she was, um, she she was amazing, you know that that she threw everything uh, toward me, and that that Disney kind of and and NCAA really really darkened that relationship and, and killed it. So it's it, it was at the end of the day, it was a fun film. Um, it it was it it opened to very mixed reviews. New York Times sang its praise. The L.A. Times killed it. Um, but it was dumped into it. It got a, you know, very, it didn't get a major release. Um, and, um, I was kind of, you know what, let's go to Europe. Mm -hmm. So that, that was, you know, so kind of dabbled around and, you know, did different things after that. So, um, yeah. So at that point you I thought, you know what, um, I have a bit of a better taste in my mouth now because of the process of that Hollywood thing. So let me jump over the pond and uh, head over to Europe and, and uh, London is where you've landed. And now London's where you call home, right? For yes. for how long has it been, Eric? It's been it's been a minute now, right? I've been here three years now. But I again, I, I lived here for five years when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a little music. And I come here a lot. You know, I have a lot of friends, a lot of uh, and this is it's kind of I almost this is when I went from being a teenager to being a young man. So it has it has deep resonance. It's it's a very important city to me. Yeah. And so when you got here um, before, you know, so before proms was was a part of the part of the thinking. So the first maybe year or two, because I know uh, you and I have talked about proms. I mean, well over a year ago when before all this Corona and before we were able, you know, when we were able to meet up every now and again for a coffee. Um, but when you got here first as a writer, did you see a, a big difference in the industry uh, the U.S. industry, specifically Hollywood, and the U.K. industry, specifically, well, only London. <laughs> well, I I haven't I have worked. I, I did come here and 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 uh, oversee and co-write a pilot when I got here three years ago. But um, yeah, it's the I mean Hollywood is is a monolith. It is it is the capital of the global film industry, mm -hmm. and um, London. Is a, you know kind of I, I I mean this in the most complimentary way. It's a little bit small town and quaint. Now London to me is the greatest city in the world, but for the film industry, you know, the in Hollywood it's a leviathan. Mm -hmm. it, it, it um and it's it's connected everywhere. So every you know every every film that gets made here is going to have to eventually go to Hollywood and get its release and you know at, at the the tentacles are, you know, are global. You know. Yeah, so, I mean, I spent, yeah. I've lived in LA for quite a while as well, and uh, yeah. there, there is a different feel. Like, it, there is, there, like, I don't know. It's, it's. 
I don't know. I don't know how to really explain it, but there is a definitely a different feel over there. It's it's uh, much more ruthless. It's much more cutthroat. It's more. Uh, there's more of it as well. Um, yep. You know, it's just a bigger, bigger all round. Um, bigger all around business over there um but that nicely brings us on then to so you're here for a while you're writing you're doing your pilot you're on a different various different projects um and then the idea of prom came along or the people's republic of movies so first of all tell us a little bit about that i'm going to pop the logo up on the screen um pop pop it up on the screen (laughs) love it there we go Uh, so tell me yeah it is. It's popping. Oh, cool. <laughs> it's popped. Cool. <laughs> Not, um, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> so the, the People's Republic of Movies uh, is, is, has been something that's been kind of gestating uh, for a very long time. When I was still a musician and I, I, I moved to California, I took a job working at a music agency, a booking agency, and I noticed that none of my bands were making a living. Uh, and they and and some of them were extraordinarily good bands, and they all had their like three to five regular gigs that were their gigs. So I, you know we had like twenty bands. So I got them all together and I said, guys, you know you have your three to five regular gigs, but if you all shared your resources together, we'd have a hundred regular gigs. That would be enough for you guys to all make a living. Uh, and it was interesting because at first I got everybody very enthused and then we came to a point where they were, well, you know, we've got seven gigs and, you know, so-and-so's band only has two and everybody started counting. And I said, yes, but none of you have enough regular gigs to make a living. So if you share and don't look at the fact that you brought seven uh, gigs and, and, you know, Joey brought two gigs – You'll have 100 gigs together, mm-hmm. and you can all rotate and go through each other's. I couldn't get it to fly, but it always stayed in the back of my mind that you've got to get people to cooperate. Then um, when I was working on – when I was a showrunner, I had a member on staff, John Truby, uh, the great story guru, was on staff with us. And we were, were, were cracking stories every week, and all, you know, really powerful writers uh, who went on to do very big things were on that staff. Um, And John said to me, he said, you realize that if we all decided to everybody in the room to essentially do a movie a month, he said, we could take over the industry by the end of the year. I said, yeah, but we can't get everybody to do that. But Mm -hmm. it always stayed with me, the power that's in a writer's room and you're just doing your own show, but you could really do anything you want. It's a lot of and, and, and you come to realize when you're a writer, like I, I'm a solo writer. I was I, I had a partner at one point when I started. Uh, but you realize that, especially in the film business, you have tons of collaborators. So when I'd write a script, I'd give it to my two or three closest friends to get feedback. Mm. They're my writing partners. Sure. They don't get a credit on my script. When they do their scripts, they give me theirs. I give them my notes. So you have all of these people doing uh, – amazing collaboration and now you've made films you know i mean mm-hmm. as i've directed and i've seen what directors go through and i've had uh, hired a lot of directors in television when that editor when you look at the first rough cut i don't care if you're spielberg you look at it and you go oh my god they should never let me or anybody else on this film near a camera again this is horrible <laughs> then that editor comes in and goes you know i've got I've got some ideas for this. I've got some ideas for that. They start making a few tweaks. And then that inspires you and go, oh, what if we do this? We chop this scene down, but we extend this moment in the, you know, in the warehouse. And, mm. and you, 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 you've got these amazing collaborators. And somebody puts a, a, an inspired piece of music on it. And somebody, somebody else puts an idea in. And, and suddenly you look like a genius. And you realize you've had all these magical elves uh, a, a very quick aside on collaboration. When I worked on Mad Max with George Miller, uh, he has a big theater, which is uh, an old fa- – and uh, the mezzanine level is all an open office, which is where we worked. And wow. it was it, it was just the Mad Max team. So there was an artist, uh, George and myself, and occasionally a makeup woman would come in to hang out. And um, it, he anybody was allowed to walk through – listen in on what we were doing 
and type in. I'm talking about you could be mopping the floor. You came through, you go, hey, George, what if a Nux vomicus, you know, was uh, like fought this way? And George, goes, oh, well, you know, let's work. It was, That's it was really brilliant. Awesome. He really knows how to bring everybody in and is, is, is very respectful. Um, I mean, yeah, one of the co-writers was an artist who just did the artwork. And he was, you know, one of the co-writers of the film. Mm. Um, so I, I started looking at the way collaboration should work and started also reading a lot of social theory and economic crap and, and started seeing, you know, um, and this is kind of all coming together now. We need to build a new economy. The economy right now is becoming more inequitable. And we grew up with the fantasy that or, or, or the belief that capitalism would give more of us opportunities. OK, mm. so now the economy is going wrong. Certainly in the first world countries, it's not giving opportunity. And now we you know, it, it's a little complex the way globalization works. I won't get into that. But I, I thought I, I, I want to I want to make a more equitable film company uh, built on the idea of the cooperative, mm -hmm. which is that everybody who works on a prom film owns a piece of the film. Everybody who works at prom owns a piece of prom. There, it, it, Hollywood accounting um, is, is a ter it, it, it covers all of the film business, by the way. And it, it, every, any person who's a filmmaker who wants to make their career in Hollywood, you, it, you've got to understand how, how the books work. So I, I started looking at the way tech people use the, for me, the greatest source of collaboration, which is open source. So, so like, you know, some 15 year old teenage girl in Taiwan can just jump on, you know, on online and work with, you know, a team of guys in Finland and, and they start making these breakthroughs that the greatest think tanks in the world can't come up with. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's dynamic and very exciting. And the film industry has an element of that. It's very rigid and structured how how our hierarchy is created. Open source is not hierarchical. No. Uh, a film set is the director, you know, and the producer. They're in charge. The movie stars and 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 everybody has this this incredibly complex pecking order. Um, we don't have to. We have to make it more equitable, and we have to honor and respect the collaboration. And that's what I want to do with prom. So, so that people feel they have a stake in everything that, that they do on, on a production and, and, and that they root for it. So that, that is one foundation of prom. The other is this, that I believe the future of business, that young, young people can see this. Uh, um, older generations, not so much so because, they, they, you know, the, the, dog, the dogma takes hold of people the longer they, they exist in a system. I think the future young people are go going to only go to businesses whose business practices they approve of. I think they're going to stop looking at, you know, the big discount store that pays their employees like crap and leaves them in slave conditions. You know, you know, I'd rather go to this discount store. They pay their people better. And so I think we're going to see a shift. I, I hope think so. We're going to see um, people allied with 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 greater causes um, things like, you know, sortition, extinction, rebellion, people who are trying to make, you know, sortition makes democracy a bit more democratic, mm -hmm. uh, and less, they, it recognizes that professional political class becomes too professional and less representative of their constituents. Mm -hmm. Their constituents become business instead of the people who elected them. So sortition is doing great work. So, so we at prom, we have alliances. And when we when we do a film, we we're, we go out to our community, our our greater community. So um, we're going to do things like online premieres in virtual reality, um, and we're going to reach out to everybody we're uh, um, involved in, with as an alliance economy. Mm -hmm. And we're going to reach out to people who aren't in the film business, people who've, who've done things that we've promoted through prom and get them to say, Hey, we're dropping a movie. See if any of your people want to buy a ticket to the, you know, to the online premiere, mm -hmm. you know, we'll take them in, uh, into a, an amazing, you know, virtual world. They can watch the film. They can kind of interact with, you know, <laughs> you're going to have a cocktail with, you know, whoever your A-list star is. That's really and cool. So we're, 
Yeah, it's very cool. We're, we're going to kind of we're, we're going to, you know, kind of democratize in a different way. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also it's, it's really good place as well. Because, I mean, first of all, that sounds amazing. So it's 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 like it's a collaborative, a collective uh, of of uh, artists in whichever respect. Um, and then you know you can uh, you know you have a pool of people, like minded, um, talented, creative people who can chime in uh, and give their their particular um, skill set where where you need it. But I think also for for people who are um, maybe in the independent realm or even you know starting out, it's 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 be a really good place and a really good thing to get a part of because maybe you're not as versed and maybe not as well connected as you wish yourself to be. But if you put yourself within a collective like Proms, well then you're in a pool of people of like-minded people, and that can only be a good thing. I I, I think it's amazing. That that's absolutely an, an important point. We want to give people access who wouldn't normally have access. The way we get you, you, you know, you, to be in the film business, you have to find a way to get yourself noticed. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to make yourself a bit of a star. In prom, the way you get noticed is by doing things for prom. So if you help, if you help other people in prom, your profile grows. Ooh. So that when you want to do a movie, we see, oh, you know, Jason is like, you know, he's reviewed and helped people with their scripts. He's done this. He's done that. He's dropping a new movie. We, we automatically go to you first, you know, and, and, and kind of cluster all of these resources for the people who've done the most. So you, you, it puts your fate in your own hands. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to Hollywood, you're so dependent. Or even, and when I say Hollywood, I mean the global film industry. Sure. And it's the same in every film industry. You know, you hand your script or you go and you, you, know, you read for somebody and you hope that you get called back for something. But so much of your fate is out of your hands. You, you, you know, if you told an actor, right, who's good and auditioning everywhere, okay, listen, if you carry... 50 bricks across the room you'll have greater access to you know to these new movies mm -hmm. and every actor is going to sure give me the brick let me carry it and and Absolutely. you can open more acts so in prom we're saying that okay so carry some bricks for other members of prom and, and that will that will give you more access because it will give you more profile so yeah. that's one of the things we're trying to work with but that's great because that self self incentivizes you to do well. Because in the normal world, as an actor, producer, writer, direct, whatever it is, uh, until you you know pop into that circle, you are all day long, every day, trying to find ways to benefit yourself to 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 put yourself out there. And normally, nine times out of ten, you do these things and you're banging your head off the wall because there's no one there to listen or there's no one there to help. But if within prom you do those things, you can guarantee that they will bear fruit because it will put you in a position um, to be more, uh, you know, to be more helpful and to be, to be a bigger part of, of the collective and, and therefore be more enthralled in it and, and, and give back to it and get from it as also. Yeah. You'll get greater access. And, and we, there are film resources in our community. We've made films so we, we know how to do them. So it's mm -hmm. not just like, a social media thing where we all get together and you know and moan together but actually don't know how to put films together we have um we're actually doing um our, our next we do a webinar slash meetup mm -hmm. the last thursday of every month uh next next one is going to be let me look this up may 28th okay um we're going to have the brilliant producer um ilan gerard who's uh, he, wow. you know, helped put the financing together for March of the Penguins, Academy Award winner, Kolya, <laughs> another Academy. He really uh, is masterful at understanding the way um, uh, regional film credits work and, and how they're because you need money to make films. It doesn't matter, you know, what it is. You have to get resources. And uh, so we, we do have these people who can help us find ways uh, to to make these films, we have new new ways we're going to do on prom through our online communities, and we're going to we're going to combine them with traditional filmmaking uh, uh, business plans. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, there there are other uh, you know, there's. There 
that's the thing about proms, which I think is amazing, is because there's a number of groups out there, people going, oh, hey, let's all pull together and, you know, let's try our best, whatever. But most of the time, if not all of the time, those people, as as nice and as, and as, as uh, positive as that is to do that, they're all in sort of a sa- same position in that they don't really have a whole bunch of contacts. So what do you kind of really do with that? Whereas with prom, it is full to the rim of people just like yourself who are, you know, highly successful people, whether it be in writing, directing, producing, acting, show running, hair and makeup, whatever the case is. So you're pulling from a pool of highly talented, highly well-versed, well-produced, successful people. Um, so I think it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful position. Now, one thing uh, I am going to do now is we're going to run your, your trailer because uh, your first project, uh, and it looks so funny, it is, it is such a hoot. Um, your your first project is the, the VV blog. Uh, so we're going to run the trailer. Uh, maybe you want to give it an intro, and then we can, uh, we can have a chat about it uh, when it's over. Yes, well, uh, these are trailers for um, the the real Valentina Valentino. She does she does you know little Instagrams and she does little three minute shorts. We're now developing a half hour TV series for her. Uh, Valentina is this clueless fashionista activist, and she believes that you know activism would be most successful. It, to, to be most successful, activism should be stylish. So she relates everything to the world of fashion. So it's just like, you know, if we if we want to save the ocean, you know, we've got to do a season of ocean blue and, you know, get the whole world. We fix the ocean and then we move on to the to the you know, next year we do a new fashion season. We save the trees and everybody wears green. And that's the way we save the planet. So she's she, she's kind of got this brilliant worldview of the way you save the planet is through fashion and being stylish. It's so, such a hoot. It's- and oh and, and to go to Instagram, go to at the real Valentina Valentino. And we're going to we're going to start doing her three minutes short um, on the prom YouTube channel, which is going to open a, a premiere at the end of this month. We'll send out announcements on it. Awesome. Well, let's run the trailer and uh, let's have a little look at Valentina Valentino. <laughs> Such a hoot. Hi, guys. Uh, hi, guys. Uh... Get ready to burn your bras. For all the ladies out there who are still single, bless them. <laughs> you better come to work! No! Go out and kiss a girl today. <laughs> we can be sexy, but also have one opinion. No? Yes? Let me. Excuse me, what are you doing? I have no one in the world. <laughs> and remember, stay skinny, stay stylish. <laughs> how fun does that look? That looks like yeah. such a blast. She knows how to save the world. We're just going to have to watch her. <laughs> One poncho at a time. I love it. I really, really love it. I think that's such, such so really, really funny. Um, and as you said before as well, the Instagram handle, we're going to pop that in, and all the relevant links rather, in the description below. So for anyone out there who, who's listening, we'll get to some questions in a minute. we got uh, quite a few coming through actually. So just as well, people, um, anyone out there watching or listening, uh, we are now streaming live to Instagram, Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and um, I think that's it. Uh, so yeah, get your questions into the into the comment section for Eric, anything you'd like to ask. Um, for anyone, first before we get to some questions, for anyone out there who uh, would like to get in contact with you, uh, who would like to contact proms, who would uh, put it, maybe like to get involved with it, um, how would they do that? And uh, what's the most relevant way? Um, we, we alpha tested our uh, a website in, at the end of January, got all the feedback, and we, um, we're now rebuilding it. So you can go to the promhq.com, sign up for our newsletter. The, the, the new website is going to be up really soon, and um, you can read all about the exciting things when you sign up for it. 
Yeah, and again, the, the link is in in description below. Okay, I want to get to a couple of questions because we are, I can't believe it, we're running out of time, buddy. Uh, we're almost coming up to the hour. I can't believe it. I could talk to you for hours. Um, okay, we got Andy here who's from Birmingham but now lives in London. He says he's a screenwriter and he has already written a series of short stories. Uh, he's asking, uh, well, he wants to convert these or adapt them to short, story, short films at the very start and potentially even on to feature. He's asking, do I need need to move to Hollywood um, or can I do it from here? Um, <laughs> you can do it from here. Uh, there, there are probably more resources um, here, more grants to be had for doing short films in the UK than there are in the US. You, move to Hollywood when you're ready to make big, big movies. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, really difficult. So I would say get your foot in in the door here. Make a lot of short films. Use the grants. Find the partners. People are more willing to do favors for each other here because you know they're not in the Hollywood machine. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's more idealism here. You know, Hollywood is a very jaded place. It's you know, but nevertheless, it's becoming less jaded. It's, uh, awesome. Yeah. Okay, and Sarah from London is asking, uh, she's saying that she is a writer. Um, should she uh, stick to one particular genre or style, or can she write across multiple genres? Um, and uh, she's saying that uh, until she becomes known, should she stick to one particular style or genre, or just across the board? That's a great question. Um, what's going to happen right now when you're trying to get your name yourself out there? Do everything. You will then be, once you start working in the business, you become known for a genre, and that's all they want for, from you. Mm -hmm. And it'll be very hard to break that genre. You, you know, I, I when uh, in the early 90s, you couldn't have been hotter in television than me, but, and I, I, I would literally walk into a network and I would go, uh, hey, Eric, what do you want to do? And I go, I want to do a blue collar Robin Hood done. Deal would be made. They'd, they'd give it to me. At the same time, the best pitch I've ever done was for a half hour comedy. I, I, I it was such a great, I, like two clueless guys who sell their soul to the devil. I don't even, I barely remember what it was, but it, I, I'd never given such an inspired pitch. And I knew the show would be amazing. And I was known as, uh, for my abilities to write funny scenes within the one hour format could not sell it. As hot as I was, I couldn't break the genre I was known for. Um, I, I can't count how many one hour pilots I've been hired to write, countless, and I've never been hired to write a half hour. So yes, you will become known for that genre, but right now, I mean, lean on your strong suit. You're, you, early on, you start experimenting. You know, I wrote half hour comedies when I started. I wrote intense dark dramas. I wrote all of those things. It was, it was with dark drama that I clicked. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it was incredibly ironic because I, I used to be known in those days as dark man. And I, I was always, oh, film, you know, <laughs> television is going to get darker. It's going to get darker. Enough already, dark man. And I've kind of had enough of it. And I, I really prefer writing lighter comedy. But uh, Hollywood wanted me only for dark, intense drama. So that's the answer. Awesome. Um, and there's one here from Eric with a with a K for Eric with a Z. He's I've saying, always wanted the K. <laughs> huh? You always, I've want always wanted the K, but they gave me a C. Anyway. <laughs> well, Eric with a K is asking. Uh, he's saying, I am a screenwriter. Um, would you advise me to to specify in television screen or film screen work right now, moving into whatever the future may hold? Do whatever you're best at, whatever inspires you. You're trying to show your your, your best writing. So if you it, it, right now, uh, um, if you're not known for something, you you you're a you're a blank slate. So do great work. Whatever, it's perfectly fine if it's television or film. I started. Uh, uh, it was a big feature script that I wrote that got me into television for you know the next 15 years. So, it, you know, you, you just don't know which way the industry is going to decide it, it wants to bring you in. Okay, we've got two more, and then um, then we'll, we'll call it a day. Um, so we got, um, what is it? 
we've got Andrew here. He's saying, how, as a man, um, do you write really good, well-rounded, three-dimensional female characters? And what's, what, is there, do you have any tips for, as a male, to, to better write female characters? You have to remember that we're all human beings and we all have the same issues in our lives. You know, uh, no, uh, the, 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 the issues uh, that, that, you know, the Me Too movement, sexual harassment, that, that, that is not a strong issue. But the emotions that we have, we all feel the same things. We're all insecure. We're, we're, we all put on a false front in order to get by in our society. We, we, you know, we, we all have problems in our families. Um, when you're writing, when you're writing a, a, another, a, a character of the opposite sex, or even, you know, it costs to be a different race from you. That's, that's just as hard. You're trying to capture the music of a voice, but you have to really make sure that you're not leaving the character superficially at the issue. Mm-hmm. So, 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 so uh, if you're writing a drama with, a, you know, for, uh, the, the accused, a woman, uh, Jodie Foster, gets gang raped in front of a lot of people. This is this is a deeper, uh, deeper issue of powerless that powerlessness that anybody can feel in it, it you know, in in in, in a, a violent mo- among a violent mob. So you have to find the deeper, deeper emotion which we all share that goes beyond the issue. So you're writing at the issue supposedly but you're going to the deeper emotion which is universal to all human beings that's amazing and uh lastly we'll go to this one it's rebecca uh from stoke on trent uh which is here in the uk um she's asking what do you do to get around writer's block if and when that presents itself uh writer's block presents itself every single morning (laughs) um sometimes for me, it's just making myself write when I don't want to write and, and knowing that, that everything you write isn't brilliant. There's, no, there's never been a writer that everything they write is at that level that they're, you know, they're just absolutely brilliant. You write tons and tons of crap. You've got to get, you, you know, it's like getting, you know, getting on a bike, right? You've got to pedal the first few times and then you start the flow. Um, those, those moments where you can't bear writing uh, what I uh, there's a lot of times I, I try to write my story linearly, and then what will happen is I'll come to a scene on a day that I'm just I, I just can't do it, and I don't understand how to make the scene work. So what I'll do is I, I, at a certain point I might just write what ha- what I know needs to happen in the scene so that I can get some forward momentum. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a little a little trick I do. Some people, you know, um, have to solve it before they move forward. For me, I have to feel that that the bike is moving. You know, the 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 bike is coasting, and then, mm-hmm. you know, and then I can circle around and kind of fix. Which, when you edit, you're circling back all the time anyway. Mm-hmm. So just when you have writer's block. You know, slap yourself in the face, make your cup of coffee, do whatever little ritual that you have to do to sit down at your work table or whatever you sit at and write the scenes. And they do not have to be good because eventually they will be. Mm-hmm. But you have to you you have to write. I'm curious myself is when you decide that you're going to write something, do you, uh, let's say you're writing, I don't know, uh, a, a movie about a bank heist and they rob the bank and they fly off in the plane at the end. So do you write story um, or do you write dialogue or do you write both at the same time? So you start at the start of the movie or the start of the story and you work your way through the story and whatever happens, happens. Or do you write for particular characters that you know are going to be primary characters within the story? Uh, and maybe write a day on dialogue just for them and figure out later if that dialogue will fit into your movie anywhere. Oh, those are, these are really good challenging <laughs> questions and they're very valuable. Um, every writer has their own needs for what will get their motor going. For me, um, I have to know what a story is actually about. I need to go to the theme level. So you have you have what the story seemingly is about. Like I, look, the script for Gunshot, I'll go back to which which I had the idea 
seven or eight. I, I, I'd done so many macho cop shows. I was kind of fed up with, you know, Bruce Willis comes in and kicks ass and Sly Stallone comes in. And, and there, I, I wanted to do a story about a cop like that who'd lost his nerve. I thought that was a good foundation. And, and my wife kept saying to me for years, why don't you do your chicken cop movie? And I always said to her, I don't know what it's about. And there was a breakthrough moment when I was working in Mad Max, and I loved George Miller, but I realized that I was in the court of King George. And um, I had this revelation that everybody is undercover, that society, anywhere you go in society, you're undercover. You have a public persona that you have to live up to. When you go into your job, there's a way you're meant to behave and nobody gets to be who they really are. So it, it was a unifying concept. So this undercover cop who, who had lost his nerve and has to keep up this facade um, is, is struggling horribly because he doesn't have courage anymore. He may have been incredibly brave before. So he ends up going to group therapy and he finds all of these neurotic little businessmen who he realizes they're all just like me. None of us, none of us have the life that we want. We're all living, uh, you know, this public lie. Mm -hmm. That was the unifying idea. A story that I'd struggled with and I'd written, you know, I'd had a very funny and cool scene where the guy goes to meet all the bad guys and he's so terrified of meeting them that he pops so many tranquilizers to go into this meeting and he's drinking alcohol that he falls asleep during a meeting with all the guys who he knows are going to kill them. And the main bad guy that he's afraid of goes, this guy is so fucking cool. You know, I put a gun in his face, he falls asleep. So uh, I had that scene. That was, uh, that was the only scene I ever brought with me that I knew had to be in the movie. But I couldn't really write it till I, I knew what, what it was about. And then, and then so this, pro, this um, a premise line that I'd been holding for five years and unable to write and had tried multiple times. I came back, wrote it within a month, but it took me three weeks to write it. Boom. Once, so that's the process I need. I need to know what a story is about. So uh, the same if I'm hired to go to somebody's project, um, I need to know what a story is about to do my amazing magic. Mm -hmm. And if I don't discover that, I have enough craft that I can kind of bluff through it and do a good job but when I want to do something really inspired, I have to find that deeper level of what the story's about. So that's my process. That's awesome. And one last one, because I think it's a really good one, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll call it a day, as I said. Uh, we got one in here from Bradley, who's in uh, L.A., actually. Uh, he's saying he's writing a story currently, um, uh, or rather adapting the story of Malcolm X um, to the silver screen. And he's asking, when you do a, a film or a project or a, a story of any kind, I guess, uh, that's based on somebody that exists or has existed, how closely do you stick to the reality and the truth of that person and how much artistic merit is allowed to be flourished within there. Another really interesting question. Doing Malcolm X, you have to get Spike Lee's permission in order to do this. <laughs> However, when you're dealing, when you're dealing with a, a, an important historical figure, what I would say is this, and it goes back to what I was saying previously, there is a deeper truth to what their life was and mm -hmm. what their life represents. We, 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 we project a lot onto the big figures, big historical figures. What you have to decide is what is the truth? And, and that truth might not be the truth of that person's life, but the truth of what that symbol means to you and people like you. There could be, there could be a there could be a bigger truth to Malcolm X than the, than the details of Malcolm X's uh, life mm -hmm. uh, and how he affected generations after him. The, so your interpretation of this is incredibly important. And there are oh, there will be people who just say, oh, well, Malcolm never did that. You know, so people will take apart historical uh, figures. Uh, uh, certainly, I, I do this every time somebody mentions Hamilton to me, and I tear my hair out and go, "He was a fucking plutocrat," you know. <laughs> um, uh, never, never the, nevertheless, um, there are going to be uh, people who will go, "Oh, well, that just..." So you have to make a you 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 have to make a decision. Are you 
are you going to try to represent and you know exactly the events of the person's life is is that what's more important or is it the meaning of the person's life and if it's the meaning you know that you're, you're inspired by that and people have to go by the depth of your story more than the actual events Absolutely. That's absolutely fantastic. Eric, buddy, um, it's just about come up. In fact, it's over the hour. So um, with that, I am going to say thank you so very, very much. One last question I'd like to ask all of the guests um, now, especially that we're going through this corona time, is um, when it's over, whenever that time gets here, um, what is it that you personally are looking forward to the most? And that can be anything. It could be a cup of coffee. It could be... Uh, Dry cleaning, it could be any, it could be anything. I, I'm definitely, like everybody else, starved for some human contact. Oh. So I want to go into a pub and inappropriately touch all the strangers I bump into. <laughs> I love it. I don't know what to say. I Which these it. days, inappropriate touch is just a hand on the shoulder. I know, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and by the way, all of the people asking questions on on, on, on your podcast i want them all to join the prom hq because they're brilliant and i would love to see you know what they're doing especially you know i'd love to see the take on the malcolm x story it sounds really things. interesting right it yeah. sounds, that's a, yeah. that does sound really interesting and i'm also curious to see um who was a bradley yeah bradley asked that um how closely or not uh he's going to write his story because we all know malcolm x uh or at least yeah we yeah we all know malcolm x and his life and what he did and so forth um so I'm curious to see how close to the to reality is he going to write the story or, or how fantastical is it going to make it. Um, Eric, it's been an absolute pleasure, my friend. Um, thank you so, so very much. Uh, once again, uh, for everyone, uh, the links to all the People's Republic of Movies or prom uh will be be it uh, will be below in the description and the social media handles websites and all that kind of stuff and um please do jump over join join at least the at the um the newsletter so you'll be able to stay up to date with all the the uh the relevant information as it comes because the guys are you said you're you're currently rebuilding the website essentially to handle yeah. uh much much heavier traffic because you know the 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 first soft rollout was was really good and and uh, and we'll certainly help in any way we can to ensure that that continues eric it's been a pleasure thank you so much my friend um hopefully we'll be able to see each other soon for a coffee in person rather than than this as nice awesome. as this was um and yeah we will we will ca catch you on the flip side, my friend. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for everyone watching. Uh, we will be back on Tuesday uh, with Sean Cronin, uh, the actor director from uh, Give Them Wings and Harry Potter and Mission Impossible and all that stuff. So, until then, look after yourselves. Look after one another. Be kind to each other. See you on the flip side. Okay. Don't forget to subscribe to The Hub for the latest episodes. You can find us on all your favorite podcast platforms and media. The Hub, your weekly fix of all things film and television and some other stuff. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Jason Mathewson.